Scano. Uh, Scano Sopuego. Giaso Gawenkise. Ganyanke Haka Nyokwe Shelta Hudenashoni. Greetings of peace to all of you is what I said in, in the language that I know, which is the, the Kyuga language. Uh, the Kyuga language is one of the six nations that's part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, and I'll, I'll share a little, about, a little bit about that because uh, my nation is a Mohawk nation, uh, which comes from our matriarchal society. So that was my mother's, my mother's, 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 mother's language. Um, and so my father spoke uh, Kyuga, actually. He was a, a language teacher. Uh, so my father's side of the family is um, one of the um, respected uh, families that maintained uh, culture, tradition, language, ceremony. Uh, so I grew up um, in, that, in that way. So my mother's um, mother was uh, in the Mohawk Institute. So she was a survivor, and all of her siblings. So she had eight uh, siblings, um, three brothers and uh, five sisters, uh, all, all, all in the, in the uh, uh, Mohawk Institute. So I understand very well the impacts that residential school has done uh, to our people, to my family, and uh, intergenerationally. So I am an intergenerational survivor as well. So when I talk about who I am and where I come from uh, and, and being raised uh, very traditionally with our, our longhouse ceremonies, um, the impacts are still very, very um, clear. Um, so just, just to give an example, so in, in growing up, I saw my grandmother um, who refused to accept her indigeneity. She refused to accept that she was Mohawk. She didn't speak the language. She became very Christian. Um, she was also very um, harsh. Uh, I couldn't really understand as a child. Um, I saw the differences between grandmas in, in the relationship to, to us as, as grandchildren. And, um, and, their, and her relationship with her siblings. So all of her siblings never connected with each other, which is the result of the residential school. They never learned how to be siblings. They never learned how to, how to bond, how to love, how to understand about their uh, relationships to each other, um, which is what I'm gonna talk about, about what Anishinaabe law is all about relationships. Um, and so, uh, seeing, seeing that in growing up in my lifetime, and then my mother's, my mother's uh, siblings, so she had also had uh, seven siblings. Uh, again, five sisters and, and two brothers. And so in her, her lifetime as well, they really saw the impact of, of the residential school through their parents. So my mother made a conscious choice to marry a traditional man you know, from, a, from a community. And so that's, that's what I give that respect and honor to my parents who had made that decision because they had understood already the impacts of, of uh, the residential school and uh, uh, made that decision for us to grow up uh, with our longhouse ceremonies. Uh, my father's family was very strict, very, uh, very, um, uh, I don't know how to explain it other than this is the way it is, this is how you grow up, this is where you're going to go, this is, this is the way it is. Um, and that was, that was my father's family. So I grew up in my community at Six Nations, right from, right from, um, probably from the age of four, because I was born in Burlington. Um, but but went, uh, we moved back to the reserve and I attended school in the reserve right from kindergarten uh, to high school and then high school off, off reserve, which was 
in a little town called Hagersville. Um, and so part of understanding, um, you know, who I am uh, has a lot to do with how uh, not only professionally and the things that I do, but also personally. So every, everything that I've been taught, every experience that I've been through, I carry that with everything that I do because that's part of, our, part of what I've been taught uh, about who I am, where I come from, my relationship to the land, my relationship to other people, to creation. Um, so it's really important to me in, in respecting the laws that we have and what we've been taught. So I wanted to, I want to share that with you and also to share, um, you know, my experiences in, in my generation uh, from my perspective because we, we have been the ones to, um, to carry um, the pain, um, to carry and understand what has happened in the past and also know that it still exists in this lifetime. And so I have a daughter, so I'm telling you about my, you know, my experiences and my grandmother, my mother, me, where I, where I come from and, and who I am. So I have, I have a, a daughter, a biological daughter, and uh, many adopted children. Um, and there's a reason for that as well. I'll explain that a little bit. And then my, my grandchildren. So I have six grandchildren. Um, and so I've seen the impacts of colonization of the residential school through five, at least five generations now. And uh, my oldest grand, grandchild is 21, uh, and my youngest is uh, a year and a half. So my responsibilities also as a mother and a grandmother is also carried in our laws. So I, I, in, in asked, I was asked, you know, what do I want to speak about today? And because, um, um, you know, my, my experience, my, uh, the purpose that I have is to educate, right? Is to educate, to have knowledge about uh, who we are as a people, about what we carry as indigenous people, because the whole intention uh, of colonial law was to erase us as a people. That was the whole intention, and, and they tried. So there have been genocidal policies, genocidal uh, actions that have been uh, attacked uh, against our people, and the first attack was against our women. So I'm going to leave that there and, and, and just acknowledge that that exists, because when I want to go, I want to, I want to take you back to uh, to the understanding of Haudenosaunee law, what we call Haudenosaunee legal orders. So we, we're teaching this now, I'm teaching at, at, and have been teaching at Windsor Law uh, to a ma mandatory first year law course. So every first year law student has to take indigenous legal orders. And so it's taught now by uh, Anishinaabe, uh, law carriers, uh, Cree, and Haudenosaunee. So we have eight sections uh, of our first year law, um, law class. Uh, and so there's eight instructors um, that are carrying that knowledge and, and sharing it with, uh, um, with our students. And there was a, you know, intention in that, and it took a long time for it to, to come into place. Um, and being able to share that with, uh, with the students, and uh, and it's a really, depending on, on it's a, it's different every year. And what I found is that the more that people are aware of what's happening in in society, so with what happened with the 215 and the Kamloops uh, children's bodies being found 
and seem to wake people up. Um, because we've been experiencing that and, and know and have been aware of this for a really long time. Uh, and the, the survivors have been talking about it for a really long time and now they're finally being heard. And so it seemed to be a wake up call. Um, and so with that awareness, it's also, um, you know, understanding what happened. And so, you know, when we're talking about also about truth and reconciliation um, and the, the commission and the report and everything that uh, came as a result of that and the survivors sharing their stories, their truths, um, a lot of times society is like in shock uh, about what's happened and, and sometimes it's unbelievable. Um, and it is unbelievable. It's unbelievable about the violence that has occurred to our children and the murders and those children who are, who are missing, who went missing. And it, it is, it's very emotional. It's, uh, you know, as, as an Indigenous, as a uh, Haudenosaunee woman growing up uh, and, and knowing and feeling the impacts from not knowing as a child what it was, because as a child you don't know the reasons why things happen the way they do. So it was through actually my education uh, in law and learning about law being used as a tool uh, through their policies and laws to erase us, try to erase us. Was one of the hard, that was one of the hardest things that I had to do because you know, I was raised in my community, like I said, traditionally, longhouse ceremonies attending. It's a, a year-long cycle, it's a, like the seasons, everything that happens um, is, uh, is a whole different way of life. And, and to come into uh, an institution like law and to really learn uh, about uh, the tools that were used to erase us through their through law, through every every process that, that that's in existence, whether it's property law, contract law, constitutional law, you know, all of these colonial uh, legal um, processes and um, principles was a direct attack on us as Indigenous people. So, like I said, I want to share a story, and I want to go back to who I am and where I come from, and uh, put in a show me laws. So I started after finishing law school. I went in to do my masters, and so I thought, okay, I can focus. I can focus on our own, on a subject that I want to be able to to focus on, which was on put in a show me law and international law. So at the end of the day, and going through the whole, whole analysis of international law and understanding that our laws are international law. So one of the first uh, laws, or one of the many laws, I shouldn't say first, but one of the many is, is the, uh, uh, the Great Law of Peace. So the Great Law of Peace is uh, one of the like I said, one of the many laws that um, uh, recognize not only land and territory, language, um, it also acknowledges the, uh, the peace, the whole intention. So the peacemaker's journey is what the great law is. And so when you look at, this is the map of our territory. I'm sure many of you have seen this um, as, a, as a flag. It's part of our, our who we are as as Haudenosaunee people. It's called the High and Wanka Belt, um, and it, it does recognize our territory, original territory. So, keepers of the Western Door is the Mohawk people. So that's on the, this this side. Keepers of the Eastern Door. Sorry, I got that mixed up. The Eastern Door is the Mohawks. Western Door is the Seneca. And then beside them is Oneida and Q 
Fuca, and in the center is Onondaga Nation. And so this journey, so even when, when we recite, when there's uh, recitals of the great law, it takes at least 10 days, seven to 10 days, to recite the whole uh, peacemaker's journey through our territory to establish peace. So we were at war with each other. Um, and that was the whole purpose of the peacemaker's uh, message, was to establish peace. And so, and what I call established a whole international um, legal order according to our laws. So each nation also has their own language, right? The Mohawk Nation, like I explained in the beginning. Um, and that each territory has their own description. So in, when I introduced myself, I said the, that I was from the Ganyangihaga Nation. So that's the Mohawk Nation, but literally translated, it means people of the flint. So that our language describes our relationship to our land and our territory. So that's how connected we are to uh, who we are, to our land, to our territory. And it's the women also who have the responsibility to carry uh, the title English word, title, isn't quite the right word, but it's responsible to, to our mother, the earth. So that's another one of our teachings um, of the great law. So, so I'm going to share just a little piece of um, the peacemaker's journey. And um, part of, also part of Haudenosaunee law is that it's very feminine. Uh, our laws are very uh, feminine, so coming from a matriarchal society, coming from um, even our creation story starts with uh, Sky Woman, who falls from falls from uh, the spirit world and creating Turtle Island. That's a whole other uh, story to talk about, but I only have a few minutes <laughs> to be able to, to share what I want to share. Um, and so, uh, so the first uh, message of, of the peacemaker, um, so this was the end result of the peacemaker's journey, is the establishment of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The, big, the first journey of the peacemaker, and, and they say that he was a messenger of the creator, so our laws are creator's laws. Um, and so one of the messages of, of, uh, uh, of creator to the peacemaker was, uh, was the role of women. And so he uh, was directed to, uh, to go to this, her, her name was Jigong Sasa. And she lives where, she lived where present day Rochester, New York is. Uh, so if you look if you look on a map uh, of where Rochester, New York, you can see, you know, it's like a, a hub, like all the highways pass through, pass through that. But that was that was the warriors' paths. So the men who were at war with each other. So she became like the hub. They would come to her home. She would feed them. She would. Um, listen to their war stories. So one of the messages of the peacemaker was that he was to uh, talk to her uh, about the role of, of women as, as leaders. And the reason why um, that message is, uh, has been very clear and, and um, understanding why is because women carry life. Say women carry the spirit of creator, right? Carrying our babies. Um, the strength of women to, to have that role and responsibility. And so, um, so with that, uh, understanding uh, what peace is, like under, and understanding what unconditional love is, so, Gayanesra Goa is the word for the great law of peace. 
in the language. But literally translated, it means a great big love. So that was the messages of peace, was about unconditional love. And, um, and that was the shift. So the shift was to uh, talk to Jigong Sasen and to say to her, you know, we understand that um, you're listening to the war stories. You're listening, um, you're helping, you're nurturing, and that the connection of women uh, as, as life carriers, as nurturers, is the same as our mother, the earth, as the earth. So that, rec that recognition is actually in the center of this belt. And this is called the Women's Nomination Belt. Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk about the wampum, but the wampum belt, this is a replica. But the wampum uh, beads, so they were made out of uh, quahog shells, they're called. They're purple and white shells from the Atlantic. So our people did a lot of trading. So, so I want you to think of this as, this is before colonization. This is hundreds of years before colonization. And so our people would, would trade. And so that became part of, our, part of our laws, was to establish these belts. And I, I always say that um, they're like brilliant artists. To be able to design these that we, we use today as tools to remember our laws. And that every little, every little bead was carved to make first a bead and then to be able to put these together in what are in English, uh, these belts. They were, were never worn as a belt. They were more, I guess, described, but I've been told described more like a mat, you know, like, like how you would, would hold a mat, um, not as a belt to carry or to wear. So, um, so with the establishment of, of, these, um, of these belts and using the wampum is also the sacredness of, of, of them. So when the peacemaker first met with, with Jigong Sasa and talked to her about the role of women as being the leaders, so she's called the first clan mother. And in the center, you can also see the house. So this is like the, the front of, of our longhouse. And that the figures are the clan mothers and the leaders. And, and so every, uh, for every title holder, there's a clan mother. Um, and so as they were going through the territory and talking about the role of women and the responsibility that women have as leaders, <coughs> because they were leaders of their children and knowing that their responsibilities to, to the future and that unconditional love. So like I said, our, our laws are very emotional. So that knowledge of, of, carrying, of carrying life, of giving birth, so there's always ceremony. So even during birth, they say also say that the fathers are also pregnant. So that, that they have also that responsibility um, in their clan so that it doesn't just become based on, on just one individual because she comes from a whole clan and he comes from a whole clan. You're not supposed to marry the same clan. That's also one of our laws. So I cannot marry someone who is a bear clan because that's my clan. So we're, we're, we're considered um, brothers and sisters and sisters, whoever has that same clan. That's part of our social, that was part of our social order. And so part of, part of that was, was also understanding that we come from a bigger concept of family. So our clan systems uh, recognize this idea of, of relationships, that we have relations and respect. 
So the role of women in carrying life and the respect. So it's almost like women, women were put on pedestals because of the role that they play in carrying life and bringing life. And the men respected that. But the men were also respected for their roles and their responsibilities in being the protectors of our families and being the strength and providers in, the, in our families. And so that's where, where there was inherent balance in, in our society. And so that, that respect was always there because it was about, it was about life, it was about the, how to live through the seasons and have ceremonies all the time. And you know, the, so it all, worked, it all worked together all the time and so, so when um, the peacemaker met with Jigong Sasa, he told her about the roles and the responsibilities of, of our clan mothers, that they were to decide who the male leaders would be. In our language, you know, you hear the word chief. That's, that's an English word um, coming out of the Indian Act system. It's not the word that we use in, um, in our language for our, our male leaders, in our, in our language, the word is hoyana, and it means good men. And so men had to have those qualities of respect and kindness and compassion and caring and love. I didn't say that already. Um, so, and in, in raising our, our babies as mothers, right, um, you would know, actually they'd be watching the boys as they're growing up. And actually knowing that, uh, who the leader is, because they have certain qualities, right? When you see boys playing, you can see that they're, there's leaders. Um, but it's not just that they're leaders, but they're also caring for the rest of them. It's like they have that, that that care for the rest of them. So that they're watching that as they're, as they're growing up. And that's when they decide who that Hoyana would be because they have the same, the same qualities of, that, of that being that leader. So that's also part of that inherent equality in our leadership is having Hoyana and Guyana, so both our clan mothers and our chiefs. But it was the women, the clan mothers, who chose our leadership, male leadership. And it was their responsibility also to name children. So because our clans are matriarchal, so as soon as we're born, we're given our own uh, name. In our language, it's Ongahoe. It means that's who we are as a people, as a human. So she's given that responsibility to name all, the, all her clan, all the babies that are born. And there's also ceremony. So when we're giving birth, there's also ceremony, there's songs that are sung, there's birthing songs, there's like, um, when the babies are, are brought into this physical world, there's this uh, uh, understanding of what happens in creation when they're born. So that becomes their name. Or you're given a name and you have to find out what it means. So I think I told you my name. My name is, is Goen, you say. Uh, and it means she's visiting. So, uh, so as I'm growing up, I I'm starting to realize, I didn't realize it until probably in the last 10 years probably, what that name really means. Um, actually, probably 20 years because I've been doing work with missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and their families now for, for 20 years. And so those women, the spirits of those women became my visitors. So, um, so I have physical, physically visiting all around the world now, but also having spiritual visitors and learning from them and my ancestors. So I've, I've really learned from my experience that they are also, they send us a lot of messages. 
So it's the same as the wake-up call of the children who were buried by residential schools. Their, their spirit is waking us up and telling us uh, a lot of things. Um, so that's the idea. That's what I'm, I'm sharing with you about my name. Is, is my, my connection physically and spiritually. Um, but also with the women's nomination belt, you can see there's a solid line that goes all the way across. And that represents that, uh, the unity and the, and the strength that we have as women when we come together to, uh, for anything. And, and to remember our responsibilities amongst each other because there's strength in that. And, be, and it's because of, also because of, of Mother Earth, our relationship to our mother. And so our ceremonies also tell us, in our planting ceremonies, because that was our role, and also our role and responsibility was, was, our, was planting. And so in our, one of our planting songs that we sing during getting ready for planting is uh, the words in the song is, um, we're connected to Creator and Mother Earth. And, and we know that when we're giving birth because they say there's that direct line from Creator when we're, we have, a, we, have we as women during that time can make a decision to be with Creator or stay in the physical world with our families. So they say we're, we're the seed. So that song tells us that, that direct connection that we have spiritually and physically, and especially during giving birth. So it's those songs that are sung during birthing that reminds us about our responsibilities in this physical world. And when that baby is being born, and we see that uh, unconditional love when that baby's born. Like it's just that, I don't know if any of you have ever seen birth or <laughs> been through birth, <laughs> but just, just that feeling, right? That unconditional love when, that, when you see that baby being born. But it's also that emotion and that feeling in our language that we're supposed to have all the time. All the time, anytime we meet each other, anytime we greet each other, anytime we have relationships with, with anyone, it's like that, that feeling of peace, of love, of kindness is supposed to be like that all the time. And so that bond that women, that we have as women, is what this rec that line recognizes. And to understand that relationship that we have with each other. So, and there's a there's a lot more about the responsibilities of our women, even during ceremony, uh, understanding that even their relationship to uh, to the stars and knowing when ceremony has to be and taking place and the moon. The moon is a is a, also a, a major another major um, what I would say creators laws and our connection as women to the moon. Um, so when we say moon time, you know, that's, that's the cycle of women. And, uh, and during that time, and the sacredness of that time, um, because it all is related to giving birth. It's all related to future generations. And so the respect um, that we have for our women during what we call the moon time. And, uh, and even the direct relationship to the turtle. Have any of you ever seen and looked at the, a turtle's back? Um, there's 28 sections on the outside of the turtle's back, right? So that's like 28 days of the cycle. And the, in the center, there's, there's 13 sections. So that represents the 13 moons in the cycle. So that's that's what we use as, as our what we used as our calendar. 
and uh, and so you know when you think about uh, that connection, that's such a deep connection to to creation, and when we when Sky Woman was falling from uh, from the Sky World onto the turtle's back, that was also part of that that creation, and and the um, the Mother Earth, the Earth that was created from her, um, and what we call Turtle Island, and even the dancing that she did on the back of the turtle's back is the same shuffle that we dance in our ceremonies in the longhouse that honor women. We call it the women's shuffle dance. And the women are honored in the longhouse at that time. And it's the same shuffle that she did when Turtle Island, when she created Turtle Island. So, um, so I wanted to, to share that, that teaching with you. And sometimes it can be really difficult because um, this knowledge uh, was stolen from us. Uh, I didn't know anything about anything about, and a lot of our people have a difficult time understanding this, uh, the role, even the, the wampum belt itself, because of the impacts of colonization and patriarchy and violence and um, and so it's it's it is being restored and our you know the impacts of colonization even on our women and our clan mothers is real today so so you know with the violence that's occurring in our communities is a result direct result of, of colonization um, and the reason why I know that is, you know, I've done a lot of work on anti-violence work, on, on violence against women. So when I first started to do this, it was because of my own experience. So I was, as a child, and I said, like, I'm, I'm a survivor of violence as well. So I'm a survivor of sexual violence from the time I was four until I was 11 years old. And in the beginning, when I was four, was my grandfather, who was uh, a, a faith keeper in our longhouse. And, um, and so I had to figure out, I had to, I had to figure out, like, how did that happen? How did that happen when we had such strong laws about the role of our women? And it was, it was totally against our law to violate women at, at all. It was, like that was the worst law that could be broken. And so I had to understand, you know, what happened. Um, so that's been my journey, uh, to heal from that, that violence and knowing where it came from. So I'm gonna share this with you because it's an important part of understanding about colonial law. So that's where this belt, anybody know what this one is? Can you tell me? Just, yeah, yep. it's the, the two bolts, right? Yeah. So this They're is, this is the two. Yeah. yeah, this is the two row wampum belt. Um, Gus Wenta in the language. And Gus Wenta, um, Gus Wenta means, um, literally translated means river of life. And so this original, so you think about these, these belts were done uh, pre-colonization. This is the, this is the uh, dish with one spoon. So you acknowledged it in, in the land acknowledgement. But this is, this was a peace treaty made between nations, um, our nations, indigenous nations, long before colonization, right? This was a peace treaty made with nations long before colonization, right? So, so we understood about the protocols and the relationships of, uh, of peace Right, long before colonization, and we understood what that meant, and there were protocols about territory, about uh, relationships, 
And then we're very spiritual. You know, our, our, everything that we do is also part of that protocol. And we always understood that that's the relationship that we would have. So when we created this, my ancestors, the Haudenosaunee, um, my Haudenosaunee ancestors in creating this treaty relationship with the early colonizers. So the early colonizers were with the Dutch, the French, the British, and then with the United States. And so the original, this original relationship, um, so if you think of this as a river, right, river, river of life, this one line represents our canoe. And our canoe held our laws, our customs, our beliefs, our language, everything, this little tiny bit that I shared about our, our laws. I need, actually, I need to clarify a little bit because, because when, I, when I was starting to work on my master's uh, in, in Haudenosaunee uh, laws, I went back to our language speakers and I asked, is there a word for law? And so they were, you know, thinking about it and, and said, no, there isn't. And I said, okay, well, well what, what was it that, that um, made us who we are, like, who our processes? And they said, well, the only word they could think of was a uh, wen wen yang. And it means uh, our way of being. So everything about who we are is, you know, everything that I talked about, the little bit that I talked about, but our way of being. So that was held in our, our canoe, right? And in their ship held their laws, their customs, their beliefs, everything that made them who they are. And that, that we would live on this river of life not interfering in each other's ways. And there were three basic principles, peace, trust, and friendship. That was supposed to be the original relationship amongst each other from my ancestors and the colonizers and the settlers that came after that. And so the intention was to have a healthy relationship. So I always use this as a tool to remember that this, this relationship that we were to have was to have respect with each other, to trust each other, and to be friends with each other. And that we would be living in these territories with that, those principles. However, when we start talking about colonial law, that was in, held in this ship, forced us into their canoe, into their ship, right? We've been forced, literally forced into this ship. So everything that you're learning in law school is in this row. And so part of the struggle with that is that even though I would say I would even describe this right now as like it's a really thin line it's never disappeared my ancestors my family have maintained it I'm here I am here to now talk to you about it they were not successful in their genocide they were not successful in the laws that were established to try to erase us as a people, and especially the women. So I talk about that also um, because, you know, when you talk about constitutional law, the British North America Act, Section 9124, where they have control over Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Like, how, how did they get the authority to do that? There was never any authority for them to do it. It was a unilateral process, a unilateral act that violated this treaty.
treaty, this agreement, this relationship. And so what happens when a treaty is violated? There has never been an acknowledgement of any implementation of any treaties in Canada. And the British Crown has taken its control of land, of resources, and forcing us into a, uh, institutions like the residential school. So the Mohawk Institute is the Queen's residential school. It's an Anglican residential school. So people ask, ask about how I felt about the Queen, and I said, she's never had any respect for me. She's never had any respect for my people. She created an institution to try to wipe us out. So sorry, I don't have, have any um, sorrow for the monarchy or the crown. Because they've never respected this relationship and our people have kept going back, going back to England, going back to the Queen going back to the monarchy saying, what, what about this relationship? What happened? What, why is it that you have been given the authority to erase us as a people? Where is that respect? Where is the trust? Where is that friendship of this original relationship? They never answered that and have refused to answer anything about it. So then Canada takes on this role in saying that it's supposed to take on the role of the Crown. And then we come up to land claim disputes. Right? So our laws, right, talking about Haudenosaunee law, is to protect our land and our territory and our water. And it's for everyone, it's not just for us, it's for everybody. When we're protecting the land, we're protecting it for everybody, for the future. And so we're the ones that are look like, uh, like we're the bad guys. We're the ones that are looked at like we're, we're not following law, the rule of law. We are. And in fact, who broke the rule of law? Who broke it? Right? So when we come to this idea of respecting Haudenosaunee law and respecting indigenous legal orders, that's the first question that we need to answer. They, we want an answer. And we want land back because it's our land. Right? Because we can't go anywhere else. This is where we come from. This is, this is our roots. We can't go anywhere else. So we're protecting it for our future children, for our children. And we say that in our language and ceremony. We see the faces of our children in our Mother Earth. And we make decisions seven generations from now. So every, and I follow that, every decision I make, I think seven generations ahead. I know my ancestors did that for me, just thinking about their brilliancy, just in creating these for me to be able to share with you. One of the things, and, and I'm just gonna end because it's already 1.30. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share about earth, the early colonizers that came in their ship was how women were treated, right? The Victorian women didn't have any rights. Women were considered human that came, that came with the ship. We were respected. We had that honor. We had that equality already in our nationhood. And so what came with the colonizers was, was the women who watched, who saw, 
the strength of our women. So those early feminists learned from our women. And but they called it rights. They said, I, I, I have a right to, to that. I have a right to equality. We never called it that. We call it, this is, this is my responsibility as a woman. This is my responsibility as a mother to my people. This is my responsibility to follow our laws, Creator's laws. This, this is my responsibility. It was never about rights. So that's what was taken, again, through early feminists, is taking our knowledge. There was never an understanding or never, I don't, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a feminist. I don't say that I'm a feminist, I'm a woman. I'm a Mohawk woman with responsibilities. The term gets put on us. Even our own men. When I was president of the Native Women's Association of Canada, our own men, oh, you're doing that feminist work. Uh, no, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, just, just that concept of it. And just making it seem like it was, like we were, at, we were gonna fight with each other. They wanted to fight, you wanna fight, I'll fight. But that's not what this is about. Our laws are, are about relationships. Healthy relationships. That's what I have taken from, from this, the principles of, of the two row, is about having healthy relationships. So that's my PhD dissertation, by the way, if you want to read it. <laughs> it's about having healthy relationships and about rights and responsibilities. So if they're to work together, right, if we're, we're to do this in a healthy way, so if I say I have a right to hunt, then what is my responsibility to those animals that I'm hunting, or the fish, or the water, right? If I have the right to water, what's my relationship and responsibility to the water? Or if I say I have a responsibility um, to the water, then what is my right to the water? So it has to work both ways now. So that's where that's where we're at and where I wanted to leave that. Um, and yeah, so I tried to get through as much as I could. And uh, actually, thank you for, uh, for being here today and listening and uh, listening so intently. And uh, thank you for the invitation. Present today, and um, yeah, good luck. Thank you again, Dr. Jacobs. That was wonderful. Um, so, we're now turning over to the question and conversation period. Uh, so, I'll let you guys start thinking of a few questions. If you could just raise your hand, and I'll point to you. Uh, we also had an online forum of questions, so I guess I'll just get us started. Um, so you mentioned that Windsor has a mandatory Indigenous law class, mm -hmm. uh, so Western, we also do that here. And so we were wondering, just in your opinion, what you think law schools kind of should be doing or should be striving to do to ensure that future generations of lawyers are really well aware of Indigenous history and Indigenous legal orders? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's more than just the mandatory course. It has, it has to be spread out to all of not only all of the curriculum in first year and how all of, you know, something indigenous can be applied in every, every course. So that's the research that needs to be done. So there's all kinds of students that can do that kind of research to put it in every course. It's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? I think you mentioned it a little bit, but I'm curious for when you were going through law school and learning about the common law, do you struggle at all in learning about the concepts, especially since you were so exposed to 
indigenous uh, legal principles mm -hmm. first that really emphasizes the collective uh, ism. Yeah, I, I had a horrible experience. Um, so I'm just going to share a story. Um, so in first year, so Windsor to Six Nations is three hours. I chose Windsor, I guess I could have chose here, but I chose <laughs> Windsor <laughs> three hours, right? Three hours away. Um, so um, there were times being in, in class, uh, constitutional law, uh, property law, you know, is learning about conquest, um, you know, principles, it's be simple title, and, you know, no, no discussion about indigenous lands, territories, treaties, um, you know, and so I'm ancient. I went to school when I was 10. <laughs> but Oka had just ended. Does everybody know what Oka is? The crisis in Gunasatage. That was the spark, actually, that, that when I decided that's when I was going to go to law school. But I started in 1991. And I had a constitutional law professor who, say there, who said there was no indigenous people in Quebec. <laughs> like the, we just we just went through this crisis in Ganesantake, like that makes no sense. So I pr it was probably the first time I ever raised my voice. I was actually a very quiet person at one time. <laughs> <laughs> but I raised my hand in the classroom, classroom like this, and I said, you're wrong. Like, like how can you say that? How can you say that when we're just recovering from a war against my people. And he didn't know what to say, and then we got pretty red. And we talked after, and we talked, <coughs> we talked about it afterwards. But that became part of the struggle for me in law school, was having to still educate. You know, that's the struggle sometimes of indigenous students when we're coming through an institution like this who have, have no understanding, no education about who we are as a people, and we become the educators in the classroom, which is not the way it should be. Um, but what helped me, because there were, weren't very many of us in, in law school at the time, what helped me was being able to go back home to ceremony. And I remember when make, even making the decision, because I was really close to my dad, and my dad was really worried about losing me to, to the system, right? So, so I, I, I was part of my, uh, my healing, my understanding. Like I said, I used the education as part of my healing because I really understood what it, what's happened and how law being, being part of it. So I was able to go home to ceremony. I was able to go home every time. Right to to attend our long haul ceremonies and um, and continue to practice my law. Right to to be in at home, and um, so that's the only thing that helped me to survive. I was angry every day, like I I wanted to quit every day because I couldn't understand like how this could have happened. I couldn't understand why it happened, and but I just kept. I just kept plugging away, and the only the one of the messages that, that happened once when I went home to ceremony, one of our traditional chiefs sat across. Like we always have feast after ceremony, sat across from me when we were eating, and I was telling him how I was feeling, and then I I said I think I'm just gonna stay home. I'm not gonna go back. Um, and he it was his words to me that said, well you know. Um, there aren't a lot of people that are able to uh, learn another people's laws. So, so I'm learning a whole other culture. I'm learning a whole other way of life. He said, you need to consider that as a gift. 
because not a lot of people can do that. And I never thought about that. I never thought of law school as a gift. But, <laughs> but that it helped me to, it helped me, and he helped me, and they supported me. They supported me throughout my family, my community. They continue to support me to this day in, in doing this work. And so, so yes, it's a struggle. It's a struggle every day um, to learn more and more. Uh, but, but what I see now, and which is I, I, I acknowledge all of, all of that trauma, all of that violence that's occurred to our women, to our men, to our elders, to our children. And think about me standing here and the resiliency of our people. Because if I didn't have their support, if I didn't have the support of my family and my children and my grandchildren, and you know, my just just having that support, because I've made a lot of sacrifices to get to this point. I was talking to my granddaughter just last night um, about um, returning back to. It's like, it's like we're true. Everything comes in a cycle. We've always said everything comes back full circle. So we're coming back full circle to our ways. We're coming back full circle to this relationship because this is truth and reconciliation. This relationship is coming back to this and respecting and coming back to a healthy relationship. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that our laws are strengthened, our culture, our language. And so that's what I'm doing as well, right? And trying to return full circle, reminding our people about who we are. And it's a struggle because of the impacts of colonization. And so. Like I said, like I was telling you from the beginning, like being in, living in this lifetime, in the role that I have today, it's, it's a constant every day thinking about seven generations from now. And when I think about my children and my grandchildren, and because I'm a grandma now, and knowing, actually hoping not, I'm gonna be a great grandma, but I'm gonna be <laughs> soon, because my oldest is 21. Um, but just the responsibilities of what we have and what we carry and the role of our women and the strength of our women, and um, that, has, that has never ended. It's been impacted, but it's never ended. And we still have our clan mothers, we still have our, our hoyana, we still have our chiefs, we still have our big keepers, we still have our ceremonies, we still have our language. So I call that victorious. So I say we've won. Um, we we are winning um, because, and I and I always say it's because we're still connected to the land. We're still connected to our ceremony. We're still connected to creation. We're still connected to all of these teachings that we have. But now we're able to share it with those who are willing to hear it and those who are willing to also practice it because our laws are also about humanness and about our relationships to each other. And even that word, Ongahoe, doesn't even have a color. It means human, a human being, a real being. So that's, you know, the, the commonness we have uh, as humans. Because if our mother, our mother's really angry right now, our mother, the earth, because of what's happening to her. So when you think about that, and it, again, it comes right back to this, when we talked about the earth and our home, right? This is our home. And she's really mad because of, of what's happening with climate change and what's happening to her and everything on her. So what happens when our mothers get mad? Right? Our mothers, when we have angry mothers, when our moms get mad, it's like, it, you know, 
Yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> so it is scary when you think about our mother because she can she can take over and say that's that's it. She doesn't need us. And that's the reality. Those are our prophecies, actually. I didn't even have a chance to talk about that. Because our prophecies are telling we're in a prophecy. We're living in one. And we have to make a decision fast. We have to learn how to live off the land. We have to learn how to live with our mother. That's the big message. And that's the message of our women. So, yeah, that's my last message. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you.